City Interactive is a developer that probably doesn't mean much to most gamers. I mean, they're not as much of a household name as studios like Capcom, Konami, or Electronic Arts, but chances are at one time or another you've either come across one of their games or at least heard about it. One of the most common genres they've worked on are the first-person shooters, and they've pumped out literally dozens of these over the years, with the common factor across a lot of them being that they just feel like soulless cash grabs intended to make a quick buck. A lot of these games either ran on the Chaser engine, also known as the Cloak NT engine, or the Chrome engine, an early iteration of an engine later used in the Dead Island and the Call of Juarez games. Later on, they moved on to the Jupiter EX engine, and what you see across all of these games is the same textures, environments, and weapon models quite often literally just blatantly reused. Generally too, as a rule of thumb, the games made in the Chaser and the Chrome engine have fixed health bars and require medkits to replenish, and the Jupiter EX engine games often have regenerating health. Another common factor is that most of these games always have anywhere from 8 to 10 missions and they're almost always able to be finished in 1 to 2 hours. Occasionally a game might be a little bit longer, but it's pretty rare. They're also the kind of titles that relied on gullible and uneducated parents because they'd use imagery and wording that most people would mistake for other more popular games. Hence why I think half of these games were military themed, preying on the popularity of the Call of Duty and the Battlefield franchise, and also the stupidity and ignorance of people's parents. I'm sure we all had that time when your mum or dad came home all bright-eyed, proudly waving around some bargain bin title they'd picked up, thinking they'd done something wonderful. If only they knew. Now, I was going through my games the other day and I realised I probably owned about half of the City Interactive FPS library, most of which was unopened, so I did what anyone would do. Yeah, I decided to buy the rest of the games they worked on and do some kind of feature video. <coughs> you fool! Yet, we're going to be taking a look at pretty much every FPS games these guys have ever developed. Many people have attempted this, but none have succeeded. Now, I should add that this list isn't entirely complete. As far as I could tell, they made a couple of games that didn't get widespread release. And some of these are still in Polish, but look, I did the best I could with what I had. One game too named Combat Zone Special Forces, could they have picked a more generic name, is also multiplayer only. And I'd argue the amount of people who actually played this game at all can be counted on two hands. So if there's a game or two that I missed, well, now you know why. So, what are you waiting for? It's worth mentioning too that this video is only the games that these guys have developed, not published. There's another dozen or so FPS games they're involved in publishing as well, so also keep that in mind. I also thought I'd do this video in alphabetical order, mostly because a lot of the titles were part of a bigger series, which spanned across multiple years. So it was easier to bunch them all up, than confusingly come back to them sporadically, if that makes sense. For clarification too, I didn't cover the flight simulators they made. Now, I know flight sims can be played from a first person perspective, but I don't consider them FPS games in the traditional sense. And I'm trying to limit this video to that genre. It also means I won't be talking about their most important title, Beauty Factory. Now, I want to stress too that this isn't just about bashing on CI games, and I will try to give positive thoughts on what I'm playing. But by and large, expect this to be a pretty critical video. So if you can't deal with that, well, just stop watching right now. Save yourself the heartache. Get on with it. Yes, get on with it! This is going to be a long one, Sunny Jim, so grab some popcorn, something to drink like a beer, a glass of scotch, or a bottle of bleach, and let's take a look at pretty much every first-person shooter City Interactive Games has ever made. Get on with it! Now, the first game we're going to be taking a look at is Alien Rage, released in 2013, and this one advertised itself as old school, though I don't really see what's old school about checkpoints, a two-weapon limit, and regenerating health. Alien Rage released to mostly negative reviews, and initially it's hard to figure out why that is. For starters, I think it actually has a pretty cool story. In the future, humans have found an asteroid rich with a mineral named Prometheum. But we soon come into contact with an alien species known as the Vorus, who also want to mine this asteroid for their own purposes. And that's enough to cause a conflict between humans and the Vorus, and there's a bald-headed guy named Jack, real great name there. You're sent to the old mining facility to shut everything down and kill all the aliens that get in your way. First thing you'll notice is just how great the game looks. Alien Rage runs on the Unreal 3 engine, which looks like it's really been pushed to its limits. It really is a pretty damn good looking game at times, and the first few gunfights you'll also notice how enjoyable the shooting can feel, due to great sound effects and plenty of cool looking explosions. In terms of just being a shooter, Alien Rage is probably one of the best games CI games have ever made, and the gunplay feels really satisfying. Every weapon has an alternate fire mode, the controls are silky smooth, but it's really let down because the enemy balancing is just all over the place. This game is often insanely hard, but for all the wrong reasons. 
Now, maybe it's supposed to be hard and super tough. I kind of get the feeling this is like a first-person version of, like, the Contra games from the NES. Even down to the numerous boss fights at the end of levels, all of which often have multiple phases. But the deaths in this game often just feel cheap and unfair. I've lost count the amount of times I got one-shotted by some rocket, fired by some enemy I couldn't even see. Maybe the rage in the title comes from how you're going to feel when you're playing it. Enemies are completely relentless and actually quite intelligent, which is fine, but this means pretty much every enemy type just swarms your position. Half the time what I had to do was to retreat to some kind of bottleneck just to even the odds, which isn't the way the game was intended, I'm sure. The level design is pretty much always flat, maybe with a few chest-high objects you can use for cover, but that's about it. Some of the boss fights in certain sequences take place in these large open areas with practically no cover, and I honestly don't think it's possible to finish these without one of the unlockable player perks, the ones that increase both the maximum health and your health regeneration speed. The game has a real arcade vibe to it, similar to Bulletstorm, where scores are popping up on the screen every time you get a kill, and after a certain amount of points, you unlock new perks. Two of these being the aforementioned maximum health and health regen upgrade, which make the game feel a lot more balanced, but it should have been balanced to begin with. Challenging games are fun, and there's a certain enjoyment to be had from trying something over and over until you succeed, but this one just feels like it errs on the wrong side of being challenging. Just pulling out the rug from the player's feet, instead of killing you in a way that feels genuine. What the fuck? Now, I might actually come back and do more of an in-depth video on this one, because I do have a lot to say about it, but for now, just let me express my disappointment, and let's keep it moving along. Armed Forces was released in 2009 and puts you into the boots of a mercenary named LaRoque, I think, going into a skyscraper overrun by terrorists with his two teammates. Yeah. On the box it says, when money is involved, no one can be trusted, which kind of tells you right off the bat that one of your buddies is going to betray you. And lo and behold, that's exactly what happens. Turns out your mission is to recover some kind of digital key, and afterwards, for no real reason, spoiler alert, your buddy Tyrone steals the key and turns on you. Like I said, the thing I like best in this world is the money. And you know what's better than a big stinking pile of cash? An even bigger stinking pile of cash. Then you track him down and kill him before delivering the key as was your original mission objective, without it ever being explained just what the key is supposed to be used for. Bonus points for an unresolved storyline. Armed Forces is similar to another game we'll talk about later on called SAS Secure Tomorrow in the way that it gives you two teammates throughout most of the game. And there's a few instances where you can even breach a room with these guys and everything goes all slow motion as you rush in and take out all the bad guys. Flash. Go, go, go! But it's really annoying because these guys are always getting in your goddamn way and they have bugger all situational awareness. At least the shooting in this one feels pretty good, though the amount of blood and particle effects when firing weapons makes it feel a lot like playing Fear, just without the slow motion mechanic. And it even takes place in office and corporate environments, feeling a lot like Fear as well. As is the standard, this one only has 8 missions, and each mission honestly won't take you more than like 5-10 to 10 minutes to finish. There's a lot of repetition with the environments in this one, there's two levels back to back for instance that are pretty much just the exact same mission played backwards, and the rooms really feel copied and pasted. You'll be using an MP5, an AK, and a SCAR as well, which are weapon models you're going to be seeing a hell of a lot of in this video. None of the plot twists will really come as any kind of shock, but at least the voice acting and the cinematics are often bad to the point of being good. Next station, blood and guts. This is a terminal station. All passengers, please leave the train. Now we're on to the Battle Strike series, which was comprised of a bunch of games, starting with Battle Strike Force of Resistance, running on the Cloak NT engine, which was apparently known as More Tier 3 in Europe, though it has nothing to do with the previous More Tier games. This one is a fairly generic Call of Duty clone where you're playing as a British commando named John, fighting back against the Germans towards the end of the Second World War. Even working alongside the French resistance at one point with a weird tacked on love interest plot that just never goes anywhere. John, you must be careful. I will. Wow, what a smooth talker. One thing I do kind of find appealing are the levels set in the forests. There's just something I find kind of aesthetically pleasing about mid-2000s graphics engines when they tried to pull off these kind of environments. Reminds me a lot of that forest level in Return to Castle Wolfenstein. Anyway, aside from that, it's pretty generic stuff. I think there's like half a dozen weapons, including a Sten SMG, an MP40, and a Kar 98K. The last one being pretty much useless due to its low firing rate. And the fact you take damage so goddamn quickly that you can't really afford to be dicking around with killing bad guys. To break up the monotony, they let you hop on a turret every now and then, but these sections are just total shite because there's some kind of weird input delay when aiming. 
It's not all bad though, I didn't mind the missions set on the train. I think levels on trains in FPS games are always just great fun. Just look at the ones in Soldier of Fortune, No One Lives Forever, and GoldenEye 007 as an example. I will. But it's really just your typical run-of-the-mill military shooter, and it's ultimately not all that memorable. I am the destroyer! The second Battlestrike game jumps to the Jupiter EX engine and has you playing as a Russian named Korobov hunting down a German chemical warfare scientist named Boulder von Ritter, alongside two other Russian soldiers who help you out during combat. Often following the players so closely, you'd mistake them for boils on Korobov's frozen ass cheeks. We must destroy the chemicals and the gas production facility. This one's okay, I guess, so I commend them for actually giving the characters Russian accents, and the German soldiers speak in German as well, which shows a modicum of effort has actually been put into the voice acting. I think the outdoor areas where it's snowing still look pretty good, and the PPS HSMG is fun to use with some great looking particle effects. You even get to use a DP-27 light machine gun at one point. I mean, Lord Tachanka would be proud. LMG mounted and loaded. This one, however, runs pretty poorly. The frame rate stutters all the time, which I think is a result of them trying to cram in a bunch of atmospheric effects. One look at the footage, and you can see they've clearly put a bit more effort into the dynamic lighting and other things like snow and light rays. But it's easily one of, if not, the shortest games CI games have ever made. It honestly took me about 45 minutes to finish, and that's just pathetic. Good boy, very well. We know all we need. And as for Reader, we've got a little present for him. The last game in the Battlestrike series, or at least I think it is, is Royal Marines Commando. Now, I'm kind of confused about this one because on the box that came with my copy of the game, it says Battlestrike. But in-game on the main menu, it just reads the Royal Marines Commando. At this point though, it would hardly shock me if someone forgot to proofread this. Anyway, this one is again like the first Battlestrike where you're playing as a British commando. During the cinematics, you even get to see someone doing a horrible impersonation of Winston Churchill too, who hands out your orders in between missions. Tell me something less dramatic. Royal Marines Commando also tries its hand at including stealth missions, where you're given a silenced weapon and able to take out enemies silently from the shadows. But most of the time your cover's blown by your teammate, who walks around with sledgehammer subtlety and doesn't seem to care all that much about staying undetected. And he sure acts like a snarky little prick when this happens, even though it's often his fault. Ah! And so ends the silent mission! Missions take place in France, Africa, Scotland and Norway, and some of the environments actually don't look half bad. The opening mission in France when you're infiltrating a villa with a Tommy gun was actually kinda cool. And the few times I could use a shotgun in close quarter combat, I almost had fun. I know, amazing, right? Bloody hell! The rest of it though is pretty tedious and I'd probably rather hang out on a farm all day and suck cow farts through a straw than have to replay it. So, what are you waiting for? I got my copy of this one thrown in with Force of Resistance 2 and when they're both combined, you almost get like half of a full game. So, I mean, I guess that's a good thing. Now before I move on, I want to mention that there were two other games in this series, but they're a little bit different. These are Battlestrike the Siege and Battlestrike the Road to Berlin. And they're different because instead of being traditional FPS games, they're rail shooters. Both of these games are pretty damn crappy to be honest, they're plagued with lousy hit detection where bullets and projectiles just miss your targets entirely. The missions where you're flying planes, only able to move about with the mouse, is some of the worst levels ever designed by another human being. They're just dog shit. But I thought I'd bring these up, otherwise there'd be that one asshole in the comments section who said I didn't talk about them. So, random nitpicking asshole, this one's for you. Alright, next we've got the Code of Honor series, this time with there being three games. Code of Honor 1, Code of Honor 2, Conspiracy Island, and Code of Honor 3, Desperate Measures. They kind of sound like the titles to old Steven Seagal films. All three of these games put you into the boots of nameless and forgettable soldiers of the French Foreign Legion. Code of 101 is really like a shitty Delta Force clone, again using the Chrome engine like Battlestrike 1, where you're in these large desert environments with a surprisingly long draw distance. Completing objectives often in compounds or bases, it appears if they can be approached from any angle, despite the fact you often have to go to very specific locations to proceed. One of the first things I picked up on was that the shooting is just really bad. There's no real sense of impact when firing weapons because there's no visible blood decals when hitting enemies, and they don't even seem to react at all to getting hit. Not to mention weapons don't seem to have much recoil and the sound effects when firing are just piss poor. It kind of carries across to the play being shot at as well and there's barely any visual feedback when you're taking damage. The screen doesn't shake or anything like that, you just get this damage indicator that shows the general direction of where you took damage from, but that's about it. 
Half the time I died, I had no idea I even had low health because I didn't even realize I was taking damage. I think you're honestly shooting the same looking one or two enemies over and over. And despite your character supposedly being a member of the French Foreign Legion, he also speaks with an American accent. Sierra One, got it. We're in position and keeping quiet. Code of Honor 2 came out in 2008 and it's made the jump to the Jupiter EX engine. This one has nothing to do with the first game as far as I could tell, aside from the fact that you're still playing as a French Legion soldier with an American accent. Voiced by a guy who kind of sounds like Nolan North, though I couldn't find out if that was the case or not. Got it, sir. What's interesting about this one is that it's full of cinematics. I mean, honestly, it feels like you can't play for more than like one or two minutes before having to watch some kind of boring cinematic, where your character talks to someone else off screen with their finger held to their ear using some kind of invisible earpiece. This is also another really short game. I think this one barely took me over an hour to finish, with seven levels all up. The first two levels are the same looking caves copied and pasted, the next two levels are the same looking prison complex copied and pasted, and then the next two levels after that is the same factory played once, but then played backwards as you retreat to an evac point. And then the last level in the game is just a series of generic looking office spaces that I think have just been recycled from armed forces. For the end of the game, you blow up a helicopter before the ending cinematic ends on a cliffhanger, implying that there's some kind of explosive device on a chopper that the player's in. It makes the cliffhanger ending at the end of Half-Life Episode 2 pale in comparison. Lastly, there's Code of Honor 3, Desperate Measures. This time the game takes place in Paris after a terrorist group called the Syndicate has waged war on the streets and the French Foreign Legion is again called in with their American accents and for mass assault rifles to save the day. There's at least some variety to the missions though. The opening mission reminded me of the Mile High Club from One Warfare. And at one point you even run into a character from the first game, which is kind of neat too. I appreciate the fact that they at least again tried to include some cinematics, even if they do look like the kind of thing someone would animate in their first semester of a uni degree. Where is the merchandise held? I have no idea what you're looking for. My issue with this one is just how quickly you die. I and mean, I guess they felt the first two games were too easy, so they decided to ramp things up. But holy shit, you die so fast in this game, it's just insane. At times, I don't even see who it was that got me. This was the point to I started to get really irritated by the Jupiter engine because of how it freezes the game for a couple of seconds every time you quick save or hit a checkpoint, which just makes the gameplay very sporadic as the action is constantly stopping all the time momentarily to save your progress. I'm not gonna lie, it pissed me off. It pisses me off. But honestly, I'm just so over this series by this point that I really don't care and I'm just so glad it's finally done and dusted, considering the whole experience is about as enjoyable as pulling thistles out of your pee hole. Moving on, we've got another standalone title with Enemy Front, another foray into the World War II genre. This one, however, came a bit later down the track in 2014, running on the CryEngine no less, making it actually not a bad looking game. As war correspondent Robert Hawkins, you fight alongside various resistance groups throughout Europe, with each mission taking the form of a flashback having Robert fight with a different group. Yet, the thing is that Robert's a bit of a prick and he's not really doing it because he wants to necessarily help. He's just kind of doing it because he's a bloodthirsty journalist looking for a scoop. Don't fuck this up, newspaper man. Aside from being a journalist, he's also a one-man killing machine, able to take out droves of Nazis with ease. Just think of Lois Lane in male form with a machine gun and you get the picture. Now, Enemy Front I don't think is a bad game, but like so many others in this video, it's just so uninspired and boring. Characters are cardboard cutouts not all that likeable, and about the only thing that it has going for it is that some of the environments look half decent. I think the missions set in areas covered in snow look really good, and some of the missions set in the French countryside honestly look stunning. It's also got a soundtrack composed by Chris Velasco, who worked on, among other things, Mass Effect, Borderlands 2, and the God of War series, so that's nice. I actually reviewed this game by itself a few years back in a lot more depth, so if you want to know all the ins and outs of this one, then go check that video out. Hell in Vietnam is an interesting entry because it's one of the few times they branched out from World War II, or crappy Call of Duty clones, and tried their hand at the Vietnam War instead. Sadly though, despite being unique in that regard, I'd say this is easily one of the worst games CI games have ever made, without a doubt. I think the big issue is that the shooting just feels horrible. Bullets frequently seem to miss enemies entirely, and they don't even flinch when being hit. Not to mention you die so quickly, regardless of the difficulty. 
Another main annoyance is how often enemies throw grenades. It's like when you're playing a Call of Duty game on Veteran. The things are dropping at your feet every 5 seconds and they have a really large blast radius. It just doesn't feel very fun to play and it makes me realise just how sloppy shooting can be in the Chrome Engine. Sucks. You can also tell there's been no kind of quality control or bug testing at all either. I mean, check out this MG for instance, which probably has some of the worst recoil I've ever seen. Fuck, 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 fuck. The game kept crashing for me at the end of the second mission and a normal person at this point just would have stopped playing. But like the idiot I am, I went online and found a save file that had unlocked all the missions so I could keep playing. Did it get any better? No, no it didn't. But look, I'm a glutton for punishment. Rumor has it they force you to play this game in Turkish prisons and I can see why. Trying to get away. We've got to stop that truck. Operation Thunderstorm is another game with multiple titles. Apparently this one was also known as More Tier 4 in some countries. Though again like Battlestrike Force of Resistance, it has nothing to do with the rest of the More Tier series. This one has you hunting down and assassinating key Nazi figures like Joseph Goebbels, Heinrich Himmler and Hermann Göring. Which I have to admit is actually pretty cool in concept. It's like a game version of Inglorious Bastards, only without the good writing or anything remotely worthwhile. Honestly though, I didn't actually mind playing this one for a couple of reasons. Mostly because I got a real Wolfenstein vibe from playing it. There's a very dark atmosphere throughout the game. You're going through creepy looking castles and at one point you're moving through catacombs with skulls adorning the ceiling. There's a silent Sten submachine gun similar to the one that BJ got in Return to Castle Wolfenstein. And you can even kick certain doors open too, again similar to the kick mechanic. Aside from that, this game actually has an STG-44 as a usable weapon. And anyone who knows me knows I love this gun in World War II games. I loved it in the Medal of Honor and the Call of Duty series, and it's just a cool weapon to play around with. In Operation Thunderstorm, you get this thing pretty sporadically, but it absolutely wrecks everything in a couple of hits, which is all good in my books. Sadly, someone stopped caring at the end of the game, and your reward for finishing this whole thing is a couple of paragraphs of text. But out of all of the shooters they've made on the Jupiter EX engine, this one's actually one of the better ones. I said I was coming. Guess you didn't hear. Alright, now things are getting a bit weird with Redneck Kentucky and the Next Generation Chickens. Yeah, try saying that five times fast. Now, I don't know what the backstory is to this one, but you're just some guy, I guess, who really hates chickens. Because he goes around shooting the piss out of them with his shotgun, sniper rifle, and minigun. Across a bunch of different rural environments. Yeah, you get those chickens. This appears to be a sequel, I think, to another chicken-themed shooting game they made back in 2003 called The Chickenator. Oh, I'm the Chickenator, come on! Nothing to do with the Killing Floor 2 DLC of the same name. Again, a game that just has a serious grudge against poultry, allowing the player to gun down droves of these things as they slowly fly towards the screen and throw eggs at you. Redneck Kentucky, however, is a much better game in relation to The Chickenator, allowing you to move around small areas instead of being planted in one spot, like a shotgun-wielding houseplant. You'll shoot chickens on the ground, chickens in the sky, ghost chickens, you'll shoot gophers, hedgehogs, bats, and you'll do it with extreme prejudice. I mean, it's definitely not a game for vegans. I hate to say it though, but this game is actually kind of fun. I mean, it's stupid as hell and about as pointless as tits on a ball, but there's not really anything to outright hate about it. If anything, I don't actually mind playing it because it's fast paced and there's lots of stuff to shoot at, which helps me improve my accuracy with the mouse and keyboard. The hitboxes are kind of small for a game that looks so casual on the surface, requiring some half-decent aiming to hit things. I reckon it's got a really catchy main menu theme as well. I mean, just listen to it. It's awesome. It's also got something a lot of these other games are lacking, and that's a sense of humor and a personality to make it feel like its own thing. It's instantly recognizable and it differentiates itself from every other shooter they've made, and you can't really knock it for that. Isn't that a revelation? A game about shooting chickens is one of the most fun games on this entire list. I know, I'm as baffled as you are. And if that ain't enough, there's also a similar version released for the Nintendo Wii called Chicken Riot. But for me to review that as well, I'd have to dust off the Wii, set up my capture card, and you know, really just be some kind of loser. Alright, so there's not really much to say about this one, it's basically just the same as Redneck Kentucky, but instead of being able to move about freely, you're now moving from one preset position to the next, and just shooting at chickens using the Wiimote. It's got the same music as Redneck Kentucky 2, and it has a similar sense of humour. Though I am a bit confused by the premise for this game, I mean the interlude screen shows the farmer, who I'm guessing is you, being pelted by eggs by the chickens. So what does he do to retaliate? He just shoots all of them. I mean, makes sense. You can even shoot Terminator chickens, Viking chickens, and alien chickens. Yeah, this one's really weird. 
I mean, there is some degree of skill, at least. It's not just about mindlessly shooting at chickens as soon as you see them. For every consecutive kill you get, you get a score multiplier, which keeps on going up. And this requires some degree of accuracy and patience. The multiplier carries across to golden eggs hidden throughout the levels, which are worth a thousand points. So if you're at a 10 or a 15 multiplier, you can see how that can stack up quickly. This game works really well with the Wiimote too. You fire with the B button and you reload with the A button. The controls are smooth and easy to pick up, so I can't really fault it for that. But really, like I said, there's not much to say. It's okay without being terrible. I guess if you own it, you can be one of the 12 people in the world to say that, so that's good. Released in 2008 is SAS Secure Tomorrow, another standalone game. And in this one, you're in command of a small SAS unit hunting down a Russian terrorist in London and Greenland. Now, this is one of the few games I'd heard about before doing this video because amazingly, I had people telling me it was actually a good game. Yeah, well, I guess maybe it is if you've been living in a nuclear bunker for the last 20 years, and this is the first thing you played when you got out. Jokes aside, SAS Secure Tomorrow isn't that bad. It's in the same vein as Operation Thunderstorm and Armed Forces, where it's okay without really being amazing or terrible either. The cinematics and voice acting in this one, though, are truly in their own league, with some of the funniest dialogue, unintentionally, I think, in any of the other similar games. Everyone just talks like they're in a Guy Ritchie film, and half of the characters are those psychotic loose cannon tropes that always seem to feature in writing involving British Special Forces. People call each other Muppets, they go on about having pints down at the pub and they say bloody hell all the time. Because that's how British people talk, innit? Do I look like a fucking Britannica to you? I don't know how they left. I know abso fucking lootly nothing. I want to go to a pub, get a few pints and tie a bun on. Now piss off! I feel you guys, I have to put up with the Aussie stereotypes all the time too. Apparently we all ride kangaroos to work, we drop the C-bomb casually in conversation and we're born with a beer in our hands. Well, at least two of those are true. Now piss off! I have to say though, the shooting in this one, look, it ain't all that bad. It's the same guns we've seen in all the other games running on the Jupiter engine, but there's a fair amount of combat and generally shooting things feels pretty good. What pisses me off the most again is how annoying your two teammates are. Just like in Armed Forces, these guys are either right in front or behind you pretty much the whole game. It's like these constant little niggling hindrances. You try to move in any direction and chances are one of these guys is just standing right there blocking you. And what's doubly annoying is that when they move in your crosshair, you can't even shoot because this red icon comes up to prevent you from firing. SAS Secure Tomorrow has a whopping 11 chapters all up. That's enough to count on two hands. But despite this, it's still a super short game, easily under two hours. The music is stock, the sound effects and weapons are mostly recycled, and it doesn't do anything new in terms of level design. Though at least it is mildly entertaining, if not for just how unintentionally funny some of the cinematics are. So don't you worry about them, old chap. They're far, and I'm here. Very, very close. Now we come to what's probably one of the most well-known series CI games have worked on, and that's the Sniper series, starting with Sniper Art of Victory in 2008. And let me tell you, if you thought we were up shit creek before, well, we're still up shit creek, only now without a paddle. Our raft is sinking and we're surrounded by piranhas infected with AIDS. It might interest you that further on there's a bridge and only two Germans. <laughs> Sniper Art of Victor, I think, is the worst game in the entire CI Games library. It's really just bad in every possible way, and I don't really see how anyone could have fun with this. Unless you've got, like, no point of reference and haven't ever played the Medal of Honor or Call of Duty series. <laughs> the only thing I can think of in this whole list that's as close to being as bad as this one is Hell in Vietnam, which coincidentally also runs on the same engine. How best to sum it up without using toilet humor? Well, imagine someone took the Sniper Town mission from Medal of Honor Allied Assault and dragged it out for an entire game, and this is what you get. There's no real story to speak of, you're just going from mission to mission shooting German soldiers with a sniper rifle. You can pick up other weapons too and use a silenced Luger and a knife, all of which are utterly useless. A wind gauge shows up when you're looking down the scope and there seems to be a bit of bullet drop over distances, but that's about all the depth there is to it. Shots again will completely miss enemies at times, despite your sights being right on them. And you die so quickly as well, even on the lowest difficulty. I mean, the game's just borderline broken at times, with weird animation glitches and the chance to get stuck on various props in the game world. Level design just lacks any kind of thought or consideration. At one point, I climbed a ladder to a preset sniping point, and they just place some asshole right at the top of the ladder who's just waiting there to kill me. Fuck you! I can't really think of a single positive thing to say about this one. Maybe there's something enjoyable about those slow motion bullet shots you get sometimes. You know the one where the camera zooms in on a bullet and tracks it as it hits an enemy. 
But even then, it's only remotely interesting because we've since seen it done way better, and it's kind of a novelty seeing it in this game and seeing how janky it looks. Overall, the whole thing's just lazy and sloppy. The ending screen, for instance, is two paragraphs of text. There's ending screens on 8 and 16-bit consoles that are better than this. This one took me about 80 minutes to finish according to my steam hours and keep in mind some of that was spent dicking around in the menu or just sitting idle. And that's 80 minutes I'll never get back. Surprise, motherfucker! Keeping the sniper theme going is Sniper Ghost Warrior which was released in 2010. And it's the first in the Ghost Warrior series. What's neat about this one too is that it's much in the same vein as other open world shooters we started to get around that same time period. Namely Crisis and Far Cry 2. Running on the Chrome Engine, which was used in the Dead Island series, it puts you in similar looking tropical jungle environments, shooting enemies from afar with your high powered rifle and scope. What's novel about this one though is that you don't always have to go into combat mode. In a nice and welcome change, there's entire levels where you can complete them without even setting off any kind of alarm. And you've got throwing knives and a silenced pistol to also help you do your best Sam Fisher impersonation. You've got to take into consideration factors like bullet drop in the direction of the wind and like in Art of Victory, you'll often get those cool slow motion kills, showing the bullet whizzing towards your enemy, though obviously this time around it looks loads better. I just wish the stealth wasn't so inconsistent, there's just so many oddities with the way enemies behave. Like sometimes they'll just randomly turn around and spot you despite you being prone in the thick grass wearing a head to toe ghillie suit. Visually though this game is pretty damn horrible, I mean the chrome engine was never all that good to begin with but here it just looks like the screen is covered in cigar smoke, it's all hazy. The main offender here is the post processing effects, I mean check out the difference between when it's on or off, it's massive. Outside of that though, Sniper Ghost Warrior is actually quite enjoyable when they're just letting you sneak around through the jungle taking out bad guys without being detected. But the moments when you're forced into combat are just completely abhorrent because of this really bad weapon recoil that doesn't seem to affect enemies, who can fire full auto without ever missing a single shot. As a result, these forced combat sections kind of ruin what otherwise could have been a pretty fun bargain bin stealth shooter. All in all though, this one ain't so bad and it's got a decent length to it, around 4 or 5 hours. Which I mean isn't long considering most other games, but for CI games, this is like their equivalent of a 20 or 30 hour long campaign. Oh yeah! The sequel, Sniper Ghost Warrior 2 was released a few years later and follows along a similar vein. Putting you in these large environments rendered pretty well with the Crytek engine and letting you shoot people in the head from hundreds of meters away. And again, it's really not that bad. In fact, it's actually pretty good. Nice work. And I gotta give props to the guy or gal that modeled the mermaid statues in this game too. I mean, that's some uh, impressive attention to detail. Damn, son. I think my main issues with this one are the controls, which just feel kind of sluggish. Feels like everything you're doing in this game is underwater. The stealth's been improved though, giving you a semicircle that fills up on your radar to let you know the direction you're being detected from and how close to detection you actually are. Also, it's obviously a much better looking game too, thanks to the new graphics engine. But for a game that's basically just an entire campaign, made out of the all gillied up mission from Modern Warfare, Sniper Ghost Warrior 2 is alright in my books. Now tag the second. Kill confirmed. The last game in the Ghost Warrior series is Sniper Ghost Warrior 3, released in 2017. And like Enemy Front, I did a full review for this one about a year or so ago, so if you want to know anything about this in any great detail, well, go watch that video. I'll just quickly say that I didn't really hate this game, but I do find it's kind of a mishmash of every single mechanic we've seen in countless other open world games, and just done, like, not as good. You know what I mean, like climbing towers, taking over outposts, tagging enemies on the radar, driving around in vehicles, all that kind of stuff. Not an outright bad game and certainly pretty accessible, but it's just kind of dull and uninspired without having an original bone in its body. We're not here to fuck spiders though, so again like Enemy Front, if you want to know all the hubbub, then go watch that video. You can even pause this video while you watch that review, then come back. I promise I'll still be here waiting, because that's just the type of guy I am. Moving on, now we're in terrorist takedown territory. A series that's perhaps one of the most well-known series CI games have worked on outside of the Sniper franchise. In this series, there's a bunch of games, starting with Terrorist Takedown 1, Terrorist Takedown Covert Operations, Payback, and War in Colombia. Now, I managed to get all of these off GamersGate.com for a pretty cheap price, with the exception of War in Colombia, which I bought a physical copy of, and that was not cheap. 
There's not much to say about terrorist takedown 1 and payback, they're just pretty boring rail shooters. Putting you on a mounted gun in a chopper or a Humvee or some kind of cannon, firing at vehicles or personnel from a distance. You just sit there following a predetermined path, shooting at things as they pop up. Each mission goes anywhere from 5 to 10 minutes, and if you screw up and get killed, you've got to do the whole damn thing again. Goody gumdrops. They're a lot like Battlestrike Siege and Road to Berlin, in fact they even use the same engine and ultimately they suffer the same problems. Covert Operations, however, is another FPS game to use the Chrome engine, and in this one you're in the South American jungle taking on drug cartels. Thing is though, there's not much I can say about this one, because like hell in Vietnam, it keeps crashing. This time at the end of the first mission, instead of the second. But this time I couldn't manage to find a save file that let me move on past the first mission. That's probably a good thing though, because this game shows hints of being broken in the opening level. The shooting is as glitchy as it was in Sniper Art of Victory, and objectives didn't complete properly a couple of times, forcing me to reload a quick save. I mean, I guess it's possible to find someone who could give me a save file to get past the first stage, but then again, it's also possible to find someone who could hit me in the balls with a hammer. You know what I mean? Just while we're saying dumb things out loud. Next, there's War in Columbia, which I think came after Covert Operations, but it's kind of hard to tell as info on these games is hard to come by. This one is like someone took the Columbia mission from Soldier of Fortune 2 and stretched it into an entire game, except it's not as good. This time around, you're an American Special Forces soldier. I don't know which one, and I don't think they ever tell you. Heading into Columbia to take down a drug lord, which all sounds very similar to Covert Operations. Visually, I don't mind it. Like I said before, I'm a bit of a sucker for engines from this era when they tried to pull off forest environments. And I really like how some of the areas look when it rains too, even if it does look like something from the PlayStation 2. Out of all the games running on the Chrome engine, this one has to have the most amount of bad guys on screen at once. You can pretty much go full Rambo mode in this game, just mowing down droves and droves of bad guys. Most of whom come running out of the foliage like complete dingbats, just asking to be put out of the misery. War in Columbia is about as mindless as shooting ever gets, and it's a little bit longer than the other games I've taken a look at too. As I said before, most of these games have 7 or 8 missions. War in Columbia has 16. But that's not really a good thing because the gameplay is still pretty boring. And it's made even more mundane because there's practically no difficulty. Every enemy drops one or two health kits when they're killed, removing any semblance of challenge. The only things that ever kill you are the machine gun turrets or the odd vehicle, which often spawns out of nowhere and fucking runs you over. Uh oh! Also, I kept accidentally shooting my allies in this because of how hard it is to differentiate them from the enemies. They all look the same. But I mean, at least it didn't crash at the end of the first mission though, so I guess that's a good thing. He's down. He's never getting back up again. Terrorist Takedown 2, according to the box, takes place after a kidnapping where American soldiers have been kidnapped and you're playing as a Navy SEAL soldier sent to rescue them. Roger, on our way. Claymore out. You're up against both Middle Eastern terrorists led by a guy named Salim and US mercenaries led by a guy named Coburn. All up, there's eight missions in the entire game, most of which won't take longer than 10 or 15 minutes to finish. What voice acting and cinematics there are in this thing look really bad, and they use lots of cliches and cheesy dialogue to tell an uninteresting story. Ah, uh, screw you! Terrorist Takedown 2 also has barely any weapons. There's a knife and a pistol, which you'll probably never use. Then there's a SCAR, an AK, an M950, and a Steyr Org. That is literally it. You can almost count them on one hand. And the only one that's really any good is the SCAR and the Steyr because they have decent accuracy. Everything else just feels like cold shit. Problem is you don't get replacement ammo for the SCAR during levels, and even the ones you do get give you like two or three bullets at a time. Yeah, you get a handful of bullets per weapon pickup. It's just weird. Far from being bad, but also far from being good either. This one's just below average at the best of times. Ah, screw you! This mediocrity was followed up with Terrorist Takedown 3. Now, according to this box, a ship off the Somali coast has been hijacked by a notorious terrorist group. I mean, are there any terrorist groups that aren't notorious? Anyway, you're an elite anti-terror unit sent in to resolve this issue with extreme prejudice. That's about the most generic description they could have possibly come up with. Look, in layman terms, it just means you run around and shoot all the things. Surprise, motherfucker! Unsurprisingly, Terrorist Takedown 3 shows lots of laziness and a lack of thought in a whole heap of areas. Like for some reason, in the opening mission you're wearing a GIGN uniform, though you're speaking with an American accent. I mean, I thought the GIGN were French. Damn, he escaped? Where's he going? One of the things I really don't like about this one though are the visuals. Everything is super blurry and there's this bloom effect I can't seem to turn off. 
The new weapons are pretty crappy too, like the shotgun, which just feels criminally underpowered and barely has any muzzle flash. I mean, look at it. During one cinematic, you're talking to some guy on a radio and they didn't even bother trying to modulate his voice to make it sound like he's on a radio. So it just sounds like he's right in the room with the player. Unimportant, Snyder. Only Hakeem matters. We don't care about his lackeys. Mustang, Hakeem must be miles away by now. The AI kind of spazzes out a fair bit too, like look at these dumb assholes blind firing at me like they're behind cover, despite being right out in the open. But I think it does have some improvements, like the shooting does feel a bit better than the previous game, simply because there's some half decent particle effects when firing guns. Like it's not on the same level as fear obviously, but it's definitely an improvement. There's a short section on a motorbike that I didn't hate, simply for the fact that someone would have had to have spent a fair bit of effort putting the whole thing together. This one is easily shorter than Terrorist Takedown 2. Instead of 8 missions, there's now 7, and they're even shorter than before. The second mission in the game literally takes 2 minutes. And there's not even any kind of end boss. The game just ends as you take a shot at someone with a sniper rifle from an airport tower. As a finale to the series, it's a bit of a letdown. Like getting whiskey dick on your wedding night. Lastly, and perhaps leastly, there's Wolf Shunzi 2. Am I pronouncing that properly? Wolf Shunzi, come on! It's another World War II shooter, again running on the Jupiter engine, with all the same looking weapon and character models we've seen before. At one point, they even used the Joseph Goebbels character model from Operation Thunderstorm as some random NPC. In this one, you're a Russian officer, voice acted by someone who honestly sounds like he's trying to make fun of Russian accents. Damn it! Tracking down a German professor and exploring super secret German bunkers in Prussia. Wolf Schanzer apparently translates to Wolf Slayer in German, I think, so at least it actually pertains to the plot itself. Unlike a lot of those other games where it just sounds like someone put a bunch of military sounding words into a hat and pulled them out at random to form a title. But look, I commend them for at least trying something different with this one. The visuals makes it feel like you're playing Condemned Criminal Origins and it even has some similar sounding atmospheric music, which is neat even if it does sound kind of out of place with the World War II setting. There's even one mission where you're undercover for all of two minutes and can walk around without getting shot at. And I think this marks the only time in the majority of these games where you just don't spend the entire game shooting things. And it's a novel change. This is probably one of the most challenging games on the Jupiter Engine 2, not because of the enemy AI, but just because of again how fucking quickly you die. It seems like you can only take a literal single burst of gunfire before you can hear your character's heart pounding and the border of the screen looks like it's covered in Tabasco sauce. What doesn't help is the amount of film grain, the bloom and so forth that makes it impossible to see through your muzzle flash, just making aim a lot trickier. Level design is also fond of putting enemies a long distance away from the player, often in complete darkness so you can barely see them. And despite the range, they've got no issues hitting you all the time when firing an MP40, something that's impossible for the player to replicate. Again, it has a fantastic ending cinematic. I mean, get a load of this one. It's the kind of thing that makes Martin Scorsese green with envy. At least one time you had a chance to do something correct, and you screwed it. Now, I said I'd try to look at the positives in all of this, and one thing I can say with finality is that I didn't have any issues getting most of these games up and running. Alien Rage, I had to run in Steam in offline mode for some reason, and I had the crashing issue with Terrorist Takedown and Hell in Vietnam, but that's about it, which honestly is pretty astonishing. I mean, they might be half-assed games through and through, but at least they work without crashing or needing crazy workarounds to get going. The games running in the Jupiter engine also run in widescreen as well, though I think that's more of a result of the engine being well-coded than anything that CI games have done. But I guess the cold hard truth too is that there's not really all that many positives to talk about. There are some games here and there where you can genuinely tell they tried to make a good game and put some kind of effort into it. But the fact of the matter is that most of these titles are just empty, vacuous, and devoid of soul. Other thing is I doubt many people have ever even played, let alone heard of half of these. I really doubt copies of Armed Forces or, you know, Operation Thunderstorm were like flying off the shelves at the time. I want a guarantee that no one follows me. You want guarantees? Buy a goddamn toaster. Buy a goddamn toaster. Here's the thing though, when you play a game that's got no soul in it, that's had no real love put into it, you just end up feeling the same way when you play the game. There's no sense of attachment or enjoyment, it just feels like pressing buttons on a keyboard or a mouse over and over. It's mechanical, not emotional. Wolfenstein 3D, a game that was once considered the pinnacle of first person shooters, is now a bit of a pixelated maze hunt, with at times confusing level design. But the character in that thing still shines through. 
because you know the small team at id Software who made it at the time really enjoyed what they were doing, and that's something that never dwindles. That's why Labor of Love games will always stand the test of time, regardless of how the mechanics or the gameplay might have aged over the years. And I think heart and soul in the game is something that never dies. But anyway, that's it, Sunny GMs. We've made it through the entire list without wanting to kill ourselves. Thanks for watching the video, and if you've had your own experiences with playing some of these games, well, make sure to comment below and let me know about it. Now I'm just going to go off and take a nap. A long, long nap. Now piss off!